Hello and welcome to this session of the World Economic Forum in Durban 2017, hosted by Deutsche Welle. Sub-Saharan Africa has an incredibly high potential for power generation. In fact, McKinsey and Company, in a report dubbed Brighter Africa, estimate that there is potential to generate 1.2 tetrawatts of power, and this is without solar. When you add solar to that mix, that potential becomes a staggering 10 tetrawatts of potential capacity. Where is this coming from? Gas has a capacity to produce 400 gigawatts, hydropower 350 gigawatts, coal 300 gigawatts, wind 109 gigawatts, and geothermal 15 gigawatts. And yet, a large proportion of Africans are disproportionately without power. So today we are asking, what public-private partnership solutions have the potential to accelerate the provision of and access to electricity in rural households? To help me discuss this, I'm joined by this lovely panelist, Jay Island, to my extreme left. He is the president and CEO of Africa General Electric in Kenya. Thank you. On my right, I'm joined by Tonya Cole. He's the co-founder and CEO of Sahara Group Nigeria. The only lady on the panel today, Jasandra Naika, thank you for your company, <laughs> CEO Biotherm Energy, and she's also doubling up as a young global leader right here in South Africa. I'm also joined by Mr. Baldwin Gubane. He is a chairman, ESCOM Holdings, South Africa. Thank you for joining us. And finally, we have the honor and pleasure of having the president of Senegal, Your Excellency, Macky Sall. He also worked, by the way, previously as a minister for mines and energy, so he knows quite a bit about this. Thank you to our panelists. My name is Edith Kimani, by the way, in case you're wondering who I am, and I'll be moderating this session. And I want to begin um, this conversation with you, Mr. President, uh, because Senegal is one of the few countries in sub-Saharan Africa which actually has access rates of electricity of 50 plus, 50 per, 50 percent plus. And my question to you is, how have private and public partnerships led to this? What impact has that had? Thank you very much. Uh, I would like uh, to say that the example of uh, Senegal um, is also the example of uh, uh, many other African countries. We do not have many sources of electricity. We are not an oil producing country. And uh, uh, up until 2015, uh, we didn't have uh, many uh, resources to provide uh, reliable energy and electricity. Uh, but uh, we developed a five-year plan, uh, a, a plan to provide uh, electricity from coal, uh, from clean energy like solar. I'll come back to solar later, uh, but also uh, biofuels. Um, we also established an investment framework that was uh, an investment framework with uh, public and private partners and uh, in particular IPPs. And uh, from uh, 1998, uh, uh, we voted in a law uh, that allowed uh, for the creation of a regulatory framework and uh, this set the terms and conditions for investment in the electricity sector and also investment in the national company. And this uh, regulation and legislation allowed us to develop several IPPs um, uh, for uh, the purchase of uh, electricity. And um, this allowed us to uh, no longer uh, invest in uh, production, but especially in the distribution of electricity. And this has enabled us 
to uh, provide reliable sources of electricity to our population. And it was a combination of public and private uh, investment, uh, especially in the distribution uh, networks. And this allowed us to uh, avoid the commercial losses that we had in the past. And uh, the solution that we found was a diversification of uh, the sources of uh, energy. And thanks to the arrival of solar energy uh, uh, in our country, uh, we managed uh, to increase our production by 22 percent and solar energy has become a lot more competitive nowadays uh, than um, other sources of energy like uh, coal and gas and uh, so we decided to have uh, this um, policy of of mixing different sources of uh, energy and uh, we are going to be introducing other sources uh, up until uh, 2021. That is our goal date where we will evaluate uh, um, where we will evaluate all the different sources and we are going to try at that date to eliminate the dirty uh, sources of energy like for example uh, coal and focus a lot more on cleaner sources of energy. Uh, we're also going to be focusing on reducing the cost of uh, electricity in uh, Senegal, be able to provide to our neighbours and uh, uh, provide to the entire Senegalese uh, population. We've made an enormous effort, particularly in rural areas, uh, thanks to these public-private partnerships. And in four years, we um, have done more than in the last 54 years. Um, and uh, we uh, have been able to uh, increase the number of communities that are receiving electricity by an enormous amount. And I think that in the next four or five years, we will be able to talk about universal act access to electricity in Senegal. Access. Obviously, this is what each and every country in Africa is hoping for. Uh, Mr. Cole, I just want to come to you, being that you are in the private sector, and I know that you're responsible for strategic expansion of business within the organization energy portfolio. How much of an impact do private partners um, have on policy creation and generation? Well, one of the things that we found out as uh, private businesses in Nigeria on the continent is that if we ignore sitting face to face with governments working on policy, then we have a big problem. And it comes back to bite us big time. So we found that as practitioners, as those who are in the field, as those who are doing the work, who are the first and last line of defense on the field, that we need to understand policy. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of policies, especially in the energy space, a lot of policies that we come face to face today and we're working with today are not policies that work for us today. These were policies that were created at a time when energy was dealt with fully as a, as a tool, for, as, a government, uh, as, a social, as a government means of, of uh, giving power, electricity to everyone. And it didn't matter whether it was rural, whether it was urban, it didn't matter whether it was, uh, it was effective or not. There was just a policy to give power out. Now we're finding out that we have to deal with different types of things, whether it's social, whether it's economic, we have to deal with hydro, we have to deal with different mixes, coal, and each one of them has to have a kind of policy that works for the people. Now, who does that? As practitioners, we're now seeing exactly what needs to be done. And so we then have to sit down with the governments to begin to work with them to say, you have to create policies, you have to create regulation to deal with this. And so we're finding it's extremely important that we understand it, the government understands it, and we work together to achieve a framework that works for everyone. Okay, Mr. Island, just going off of what Mr. Cole said, uh, first of all, do you agree that the policies which are currently in place are outdated and do not fit the needs that we have currently? And how do you overcome that? Um, well, I, number one, I, I do agree. It, it depends by country, uh, and we've seen a lot of um, movement of trying to change policies um, across countries. Some are privatizing, uh, using IPPs, et cetera. I think the biggest important thing is the consistency of the policy. Um, 
even if it's a bad policy, as long as it's consistent, then you know how to how to interact. It's when things change um, that that not just us as equipment suppliers or project developers, but also the financiers. Uh, they're looking at long-term loans. They want to see some security in the ability of that uh, loan to, pay, to be paid back. So I think that's that's another key piece. And I think you know I agree with with Tony on that completely. In that we need to continue to work with government to make sure that on a public policy basis, you know, it's it's fair and and it makes sense and it's investable and uh, at the same time serves the, the needs of what the government needs to do. And, um, and I think that's also part of it. But like I said, there's, a, there's 54 countries in Africa and they all have different uh, ways to go about it. But I think most of them are, are starting to use a lot more private sector, especially in the generation side, uh, private sector um, generation uh, capability. And that's gonna require a lot more financing and a lot more private financing. Uh, which will have its own <clears throat> um, aspects of how they bring and look at policy uh, in their investment decisions. So it's important. Okay, I'd like now to get into costs because electricity for me, particularly in Kenya, is very expensive. And this same report by McKinsey and Company said that in order for us to actualize this potential, the entire continent would need $490 billion. And this is just to generate it, and 350 billion extra to transmit and distribute it. Um, so, Mr. Ngubane, you're in a very unique position in that you're a power utility. Why are the prices still so high, even though we are generating overcapac in overcapacity? Well, initially, when the first build program that was around the 1980s was completed, the prices came down dramatically. We went back to high cost electricity because we were building two mega power stations to a tune of about 360 billion rand. That obviously has got to be supported by NASA, which is our regulator, in terms of setting higher tariffs. Once we have commissioned all our new build, we are very confident that we will pay off the government guarantees, paying at 115 billion rands every year for five years, eliminate that, and when that is gone, we can then have realistic prices which are affordable for everyone. And what do these realistic prices look like? Because as it is, it takes an average 2,000 US dollars to connect an African to the grid. My friend was telling me the other day that it cost him 150,000 Kenya shillings. That's just about 1,500 US dollars to connect power to his grandmother's house. Well, we've got uh, different financing mechanisms. We've got free basic electricity. We connect the poor homes free of charge. Mm -hmm. Th those who can afford pay 100 rand for the meter box or the pre prepaid box. Otherwise, the connection is borne by ESCOM from his own resources. Okay, we'll come back. Um, to those poor people and the quality of electricity they're getting. But Jasandra, the role of renewables in adding capacity to the grid, how much of it is being taken seriously in Africa? Um, I would say that there's a growing trend towards it being taken seriously. And you know, Senegal is a fantastic example in the most recent years where they've actually brought projects online. Um, the 20 megawatt Bokal project, and I think it's 11 megawatts of Malikunda with an ex uh, ability to expand that. Uh, in addition to that, we're seeing more and more across the African continent. I, I mean, I look at Biotherm as a company. We've expanded into several countries because of renewable energy. Um, you know, we've won in Burkina Faso, and that's 34 megawatts, and they're deploying renewable energy. They're deploying solar. Um, similarly in Ghana, uh, for that matter. So we're definitely seeing an increase in that. Um, if you look at Kenya, your home country, um, the 300 megawatt Lake Tekana wind project, that is a transformational project in terms of power production from renewable energy sources, and I think it's close to completion at this point in time. So I would say in the last three years, we've seen an extensive increase in the number of renewable projects coming online across the African continent. Your Excellency, Jasandra is talking about renewables, and obviously the introduction of smart or green technology has the immediate challenge of funding. So where does the money come from as the African collective? Should there be a kitty, for example, that goes into financing these green energy? 
Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, before I answer this uh, question uh, and uh, talk about financing, I just wanted to add something. And uh, this is about the cost of uh, electricity. And uh, despite the PPP projects and the IPP projects, uh, electricity remains very expensive today. In terms of uh, the IPP projects, uh, what uh, was uh, promoted was um, uh, contracts where prices were uh, fixed according to two parameters. First of all, there were the fixed costs uh, that the uh, country or the national company had to pay to the investor to produce electricity. And so that those are the fixed costs and then there are the variable costs and the variable costs depend on the source of uh, electricity, uh, whether it's gas, uh, solar, um, coal, etc. So what we need, first of all, is that the fixed costs are as low as possible because we need uh, uh, private uh, investment. And if private investment cannot provide us with uh, long-term long sources of financing, then that is going to make the cost of electricity higher. Um, the other element is that uh, a lot of countries um, are, are suffering under the take or pay uh, contracts. Uh, so uh, you uh, produce uh, five uh, megawatts, but uh, you have to take 85% of that, uh, no matter how much you actually uh, consume in reality. Um, so this is a problem. And in uh, if there are a lot of these... Uh, uh, IPP projects, uh, it uh, will have an effect uh, on the costs. And so we have to think together about alternative ways of reducing the costs uh, because uh, 20 years ago we started off with uh, IPPs and PPPs, um, part partnerships between governments and the private sector. Um, but um, uh, we need to come up with new solutions. Uh, in terms of uh, solar energy, it is uh, not a constant source of energy. And this is what uh, partly makes it quite expensive um, because you need to have solar panels, um, which in the past cost uh, very, very much, but the, the, co the cost has dropped now. Um, the costs have dropped, but we still need to uh, finance uh, the installation of this kind of infrastructure. And we need uh, to also um, focus on financing more of these uh, clean energy projects. And so the terms of the financing have to be more favorable um, in order to prevent uh, further greenhouse gases and pollution. Um, and for all those who are working in the development field, uh, I really think that they need to be facilitating financing for um, clean energy. Um, and uh, Senegal uh, received uh, uh, funds uh, from private institutions in the UK and in France and they uh, provided uh, some uh, of uh, the money needed and they went to the market for the rest that was required. So there are many different options to finance these projects in order to um, decrease uh, the costs and help us to produce in Africa. Okay, um, so thank you, Your Excellency. I'm just going to throw that point back to you, Mr. Cole. Are we able to come up with more creative and perhaps even disruptive ways of not just generating, but the question of distributing this energy that we're harnessing? Right. Well, absolutely. So, um, and uh, the uh, Mr. President talked about uh, the issue of take or pay. You talked about the issue of cost, and all of these things are vital if we're going to get uh, energy across Africa. 
Once you look at the African continent and you look at where, there's an, where, the Af where electricity is needed and how to get there, the issue you gave in Kenya, you would find out that a lot of places are outliers. They're places that are outside of the grid, and you have to have off-grid solutions to deal with that. Now, you must be able to address that specifically and allow players uh, to come in and distribute power of grid solutions that work for uh, rural areas for, uh, and become effective, cost effective for them. The minute you begin to try to put a structure that, that you find in the urban area and you transmit all the way there to give, off -grid, you, to give, give on grid solutions for, to off grid locations, then you have a problem. Your cost just goes haywire. And that's one of the problems that we have. The next thing that you have to then look at is for on-grid areas, can you then create uh, what you would call captive markets, captive solutions and all of that, which is the IPP model to a large extent tries to do that, but you need to develop that a lot more such that you can then create within the urban areas a willing buyer, willing seller situation between uh, receivers, uh, those consumers and distributors and have that arrangement. A lot of countries shy away from doing that, but you really need to allow the distribution companies to begin to work with the consumers to find out, are you willing to pay this? Because if you take Nigeria, for example, you would find out that the alternate source of energy that they generate through generators, diesel, and all of that is far higher than the tariffs that they pay on electricity. However, if you are not allowed to have that discussion with them, then you cannot even begin to close the gap in giving them the power that they need. So those are some of the solutions that you need to do. Allow the distribution, the, the regulators should create a framework that allows a willing buyer, willing uh, seller uh, negotiation, allow for off-grid solutions even within a franchise if you do it by franchise. So as a distributor in Lagos, for example, I have places within Lagos where an on-grid on solution becomes too expensive for those who receive power even within my franchise area. So can I not then provide an off-grid solution within that franchise? But no, I'm, I'm meant to drag a line all the way there. And the minute I do that, it becomes ineffective for either myself or for the receiver. So we need to be a lot more flexible in how we deal with the solutions of electricity. Gubane, how practical do you think what Mr. Cole is saying is? Is it possible for ESCOM, for example, to hold a survey and say, hey, are you interested in nuclear power? Are you willing to pay for it? And can this work? Well, he talked about you know, taking electricity off the national grid. We have done that excellently. All our electrification projects come off the national grid. Mm. We have got the big municipalities, district councils, as the distributors of bulk electricity they buy from ESCO. So the system is well developed. Maintenance of the system, we even use helicopters to do live wire maintenance, is very well developed. Now, coming to the issue of, uh, or in fact, we believe that economies of scale create efficiency and reduce costs. That's why we would like to see in the Southern African power pool us agreeing with SADC countries to have a common corridor going through all the countries because that will reduce the cost of transmission. Coming to nuclear, nuclear is part of the integrated resource plan which was agreed in 2010 and will conclude in 2030. We are now revising and upgrading that integrated resource plan. Coal, nuclear, wind, solar, hydro, palm storage are all part of our integrated resource plan because this aligns all the stakeholders in the country in one direction, creates efficiency and reduces costs. So nuclear is part of the government policy plan and obviously, we will consult with stakeholders as we normally do, consult with parliament as you are currently doing. That is, is taken as granted. Mr. Ireland, uh, Mr. Tangubane is talking about an integrated generation pool. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think we're moving too fast? 
you know, are we looking too far ahead into the future 2030 nuclear capacity instead of focusing on, say, the next five years and what solar can do for us? Well, again, I think every country is different. Um, <clears throat> you know, you have a country that has got as much power here as the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, so it is not quite with only 40 million people uh, or 50 million people. So I think it is, and, and a well-developed, as, as the Chairman said, uh, well-developed um, power grid and, and capability. So I think that is a different view from, let us say, other countries that are uh, power starved. And I think it is a question of accessibility versus availability. And accessibility is reaching the people that don't have power in the rural areas, et cetera. And availability is having consistent supply of power in the economic areas, typically the urban areas in many countries where there is going to be industrialization, et cetera. So I think and that can be big power plants and, and then the, the off-grid, if you will, or the accessibility is a whole different game. And I would argue that the off-grid, depending on uh, or the, the rural areas, depending on the size, uh, it doesn't make sense to run a grid out to, at there. This doesn't make any financial sense. But what does, maybe there is microgrids, mini grids, solar home solutions, a bunch of different entrepreneurial innovative solutions that are out there. However, they are not necessarily an, a, what I would call an electrical solution. They are a financial solution. So if I am in a village and I can afford a 20,000 shilling solar home system, it is a financial decision and it gives me light at night and whatever power it will generate. And it is not the same as running a line and regulating what the power cost is and things like that. So I think there is a lot of different ways to get at it. And I think there is a lot of uh, innovation that is being done by the private sector, by many innovators. Uh, here in Africa around really s solving the issue. And I think it is a combination of both. And the incentives that government can give, and I agree again with Tonya from a standpoint of if you go into an industrial area, into a, a company, and they know that eventually they are going to they're gonna need 20 megawatts or let us say 30 megawatts of power, but what they build now is 10, or what they need now is 10. But you put in the infrastructure for all 30, and sell 20 back to the grid. And then over time, they will take it back privately as they expand. So there is a way to basically build out your, your power infrastructure on the backs of the private sector. Now, there has to be policy changes and negotiations, but that is what is being done in, in many of the developed countries. And it really drives a combination of investment in industry and industrialization as well as investment in the power grid. So, Jasandra, as an African solution, what would you think is more important, improving price points, as we've talked about, and connectivity, or improving the, re the resilience of the existing networks um, and growing capacity? Well, um, I think uh, I'd question the resilience of existing networks at times. Um, I strongly believe that there is a huge opportunity from an off-grid solution basis. And let me define how I see off-grid, because I think everyone has their own definition. To me, it is anything that is not uh, providing power to your, your utility. So it could be captive power in the sense of uh, large uh, or even small um, cons uh, commercial and industrial users who are looking to have power within their fence, if I could use that term, and being able to, to generate their own power, thereby enabling security of supply. Often we see across the, the African continent is power outages for eight hours a day. And nine out of 10 times, it's during the most productive hours of the day, which is during the daytime, and thereby solar becomes a good um, solution for that. Now, over the last four years, solar has come down in price roughly to 20, 25% of what it was uh, four years ago. And as a result of it, the levelized cost of electricity that one can actually produce power at has come down quite significantly. Uh, a good example is um, the South African Renewable Energy Program in their first round of, of projects, solar was roughly around 2 rand 75 um, on a nominal basis. And if I uh, look at where round 4 is priced, it's roughly around 70 cents. So that in itself, in, in a space of four and a half years, has come down dramatically. And more and more, we're seeing that across uh, Africa. So I do believe the off-grid solution is, is, is a good one to take advantage of. And to Jay's point, it is financial innovation that's going to really drive this. The cost of production from solar has come down significantly. It's how do people actually 
afford the solution. The solutions are coming down to a point where it can be just a, a, a TV, a solar TV or a refrigerator, and we're seeing uh, the private sector come up with some fantastic innovation. Um, you know, a, f a favorite company of mine is, is, is M. Copa, and I, um, I believe they could be here today. And what they have done from driving innovation both, at, and, and this is at a consumer level, has just been fantastic. And the more and more we're going to see companies like that rolling out into the off-grid um, uh, environment. Thank you, Jacindra. We're going to come to uh, what you talked about, the pay-as-you-go subscription models and how effective they are for Africa. Uh, but you also mentioned power outages. I think each and every one of us here has experienced them. Your Excellency, I don't know if you have power outages in State House. Do you? Nous en avions beaucoup. We had uh, quite a lot of them, but I have to say that uh, it has gone down a lot. It is impossible that there are no outages at all because an accident can happen as well as an incident. But uh, we went from 900 hours of outages uh, per year six years ago when uh, uh, I uh, came into power in 2012. We have reduced uh, this uh, rate of outage uh, by 100 per year. It's not only about uh, production capacity. It's uh, sometimes uh, the networks. Uh, sometimes the networks are very, very old. Uh, you have uh, high tension and low tension networks and everything uh, concerning the uh, transmission of uh, electricity depending on weather patterns. So we do have outages, but I have to say that uh, in Senegal today, we don't have that kind of difficulty. We have stabilized the network. We have increased the production capacity by 40%. And we are busy completing the interconnection of the transport network. There was one third of the country that uh, was an interconnected network. We know that isolated areas cost a lot. Uh, you have to transport fuel to the area, you have to use the generators, etc. So now what we are doing is by using high tension lines of 250 volts or more, we are uh, connecting areas to have one and only network. And it also allows us to connect to neighboring countries. But I need to pay tribute to the efforts of uh, South Africa. The countries are not the same, obviously. Uh, South Africa has uh, a ca fantastic capacity for electricity production. It's not uh, surprising that it is the only country in Africa that has nuclear. So we have to inspire ourselves from uh, this experience and this example. Each country must adapt. Uh, solar is accessible to everyone today. And it is also a solution for isolated, far-off areas. You can electrify uh, isolated areas, have uh, microgrids, uh, because uh, the uh, rural areas are not very uh, populated. There are also other source of sources. Uh, um, for example, wind energy uh, everywhere in Africa, or you also have traditional uh, sources like coal, for example. Uh, we cannot just uh, bury it. We can't uh, forget it entirely. But coal must be used uh, by using also clean energy. And uh, I think that that is how we uh, reduce outages. If there is go good cooperation with the SADC countries, uh, it would be very beneficial <coughs> for acceptable rates. And uh, with the West African power pool, 
uh, we have arrived at results uh, that are very promising. Interconnected networks, for example, where we have gas or oil, and Senegal also has gas. And there needs to be a regional uh, regulation because we have to work at the scale of Africa. If each country wants to develop its own uh, system, then we will never get the results that we want. Thank you. Yes, sure, go ahead. Who's to pay for all of this? That's a good question. Mr. President, who is to pay for all of this? I would say. I'm very dead. In fact, uh, first of all, we have to recognize that it is the consumer who pays. That is the truth. And including the poorest consumer, those uh, who pay the more, more for uh, energy are usually the poorest ones, uh, whether they use a hurricane lamp or something else. Uh, over the month, uh, uh, electricity is uh, far more expensive. So there must be more social justice. That means uh, making electricity available, cheap electricity. Uh, solar allows that today. And uh, for rural areas uh, that are very far away, this can be done uh, so that those who are the poorest uh, pay less for electricity. Uh, they pay a very high price uh, today. They don't have electricity uh, to work. Uh, they don't have electricity uh, to uh, f f operate machinery. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all, uh, everything is done by hand. And governments, partners, the Green Fund, and everybody must uh, participate uh, so that uh, Africa be electrified. Uh, the continent has many, many energy sources, whether it be uh, water, uh, rivers, uh, African underground, coal, uranium, etc. So Africa has many, many resources. We have the sun also, which is there 365 days out of 365. So we have to develop funding mechanisms so that universal access becomes a reality. It's not impossible in my mind, and the states must make an effort. Each country must make an effort, and there also has to be uh, a subsidy, and uh, also the international community must uh, uh, help uh, for us to access clean energy as well. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, what you're saying about universal access, perhaps having less um, expensive access for the poor in community, is already happening in South Africa. I know that about 2 million households are getting 50 kilowatt hours of power every month for free. So how can other African countries learn from South Africa? Well, this is why I was very happy that His Excellency spoke about cooperation that's happening in the Southern African power pool. But we look to take that cooperation even further. We are building our interconnector right up to the Great Inga. And we certainly can connect up with ECOWAS countries because economies of scale are what are going to reduce cost and bring about efficiency. So we can all share in terms of universal access, how we cross-subsidize that. Government in South Africa is already subsidizing uh, rooftop uh, uh, solar as well as the water heating through solar. So subsidies can be negotiated if we have continental strategies through the AU or regional strategies. So we welcome that approach and we'll certainly look forward to further discussions. Tonya. Oh, sorry, go on. Okay. No, no that's fine. <laughs> okay. okay. So it, it's, a, it's a major point that has been brought up here because it ends up drilling down to the issue of tariffs and where subsidies come in and where, where cost-effective tariffs uh, meet. And there's a meeting point for both. 
if we're going to close this energy gap in Africa at all, then we have to address both of them and we have to address them carefully. We cannot, uh, all of this, whether it's transmission lines, whether it's gas supply, whether it's coal, whether it's wind, uh, whatever it is, has a cost. And that cost is borne all the way down by the consumer, as, as Mr. President said. And that's the first point. He pays or she pays. And it flows all the way back up. Where you have the gap, then we'll not be able to close it. But somebody has to close that gap. And it's a huge gap. The burden on government to close that gap is tremendous, and they can't. So the government can't close the subsidy gap. The private sector cannot close the subsidy gap. Somebody has to do it. Now, where no one is answering that question. No one is looking at it to say, how is this going to be closed? And at what time is it going to be closed? We want power today. We need it as quickly as possible. But we have a huge gap that, if not addressed, will keep us where we are for another I don't know, decade, two decades, thereabouts. So, so how do we one, do it? Can you, uh, can one I second, please. Let me just um, oh, follow up with okay. what you've said. Earlier, we started talking about policies. So how important do you think regulatory frameworks for power utilities, such as yourself and ESCOM, would go in as far as reducing these tariffs we're talking about? Well, ESCOM has driven the point, which I agree with, that scale is the issue. Because scale does bring down price over time. But you can't scale overnight. So as long as you are driving the scale and you're pushing scale, there's a cost to that. Regulation helps in that as long as the government also realizes that as you're scaling and so you're building up, that that cost has to be either deferred, paid back, and that's where that conversation is so hard to have. Because when the private company comes in to begin to talk about scale, about subsidies, and about regulations, then it looks as if you're doing that because you want to make money today. But it's a discussion that must be had. If you're going to invest another billion dollars or another two billion dollars in expanding because you know that down the line, five years down the line, it's going to bring the cost down, somebody has to cover that. And it does not necessarily mean that what you're trying to do is make money for yourself today. Yes, private companies work with profit at the end of the day. That has to be done because if not, you're going to go down. But it's a discussion that must be had and must be had in an environment of trust. I'm not seeing that happening as much as it should. Yes, Dr. Bani, you wanted to say something. No, I wanted to refer to our customs uh, union arrangements with the Sutu, Botswana, uh, Swaziland. It has worked very well for our neighbors. We share the revenues through the ports, import revenues, and they do well. It's, it's a major part of their budgets. We can surely use that model in terms of energy, how we structure the sharing. But most important is to bring in the private sector into this, because private sector will come with technology, with expertise, project management, but also they can source funding. So public-private uh, cooperation, intra-regional cooperation, continental cooperation will be the way to move. Can, All right. I, make, can uh, I make a point on this? Yes, I actually okay. wanted to ask you a question and very <laughs> briefly because we have to open the okay, conversation to the audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as you answer that, you can also tell me where um, pay-as-you-go subscription models, where they come in and how vital okay. they are. Yeah. Well, I, I think one of the things to think about is two things. One is the value chain from fuel to consumer. All right, there, It has to be investable and there has to be a return on that. You can argue what the return levels are going to be, but there, there should be at least a return of some uh, on, on, the, on the money that's invested through that process. Now, if governments want to subsidize pieces of that, that's their call. And I think the way to think about it is the, t the cost of getting electricity, including the financing costs and the CapEx charge, is, needs to be understood. Because what's happening now is people aren't factoring in the cost to the economies of alternative energy sources. And I'm talking about diesel generation and or, and or the cost of no power. So if, if you think, if the goal of power is to generate industrialization and economic growth in many countries, you have to figure out someone has to pay for it. And then if you know what the cost is and then you can, if you want to subsidize the, the, the lower economic strata, fine, you charge the industries, whatever. But there, 
And the key around, because we're not just in the aspect of selling equipment, we're also in the aspect of building factories. And I've got to go and put, make decisions on where there's a security of supply of power at the right cost. Uh, logistics is another issue, and skilled, skilled labor are, are three key things. And that's in the electricity piece. When you talk about high-tech manufacturing, you're going to need 24-7 total security of supply. And it can't be a diesel generator that fires up every three hours as there's a fluctuation in the grid. So those are the kind of things that I think, again, policy and strate strategic thinking with government and private sector around getting both that as well as the accessibility to the pay-as-you-go. That's the MCOPA model pretty much in, in uh, Kenya. Um, people fundamentally utilizing the infrastructure for mobile money uh, to basically pay for uh, electricity when they can. And I think, you know, that's fundamentally uh, a sound idea if you can, again, it's a financial discussion, it's not uh, an electrical technical discussion as much. All right, I'd like to open up this conversation to members of our audience here. Uh, because we only have 10 minutes, I hope our producer will be kind enough to give us another five. He says yes. <laughs> um, kindly be brief, introduce yourself, and then ask your question. I see a hand at the back there. Well, hello, the, my name is uh, Nicholas Champeau. I'm a journalist with Radio France International. I was wondering uh, what sort of uh, signals or uh, commitments President Macky Sall and uh, perhaps Jay Ireland were getting from the Donald Trump administration with regards to the, the Power Africa program and whether uh, you believe that this program has led to uh, concrete results. Thank you. Um, I think, Your Excellency, you can begin with that, given especially that this project is now, I think, getting into its third year, third or fifth year. We, um... Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Power Africa was a program of the American government initiated by uh, President Barack Obama and today uh, President uh, Donald Trump. Uh, it is uh, operating. This uh, program has not been put into question. It uh, continues and we work uh, on other programs as well with the American uh, government. The Millennium uh, Challenge for uh, Africa Senegal was uh, eligible for a second uh, compact, and uh, we are busy working with the MCC administration for uh, the formulation, and energy was the focal point of this second compact. The uh, programs uh, continue uh, with the Trump administration. There has not been uh, any change, and we continue our cooperation with the American government. Thank you leave that answer as is. I hope you're happy with that. There's a question here. Yes, hi. Uh, Paul Schmodeloka from Alpha Technologies. We're a uh, technology company in the off-grid space, so we make enabling uh, power electronics for that. Um, in parts of the world today, we see changes in the utility model where either in off-grid or even grid tie for reliable power that now finance companies are making a play there, literally creating utilities off off-grid. I'm wondering if Ms. Snyker or Mr. Cole or Jay, if you guys would care to comment whether we would see an evolving model in Africa where financial companies will help finance that capital cost up front in the either off-grid or in the reliable uh, grid space. I'll have, um, yeah, Ms. Snyker, please go ahead. Great. Uh, we're already seeing that. Um, there have been three joint ventures in South Africa alone focusing purely on the rooftop space whereby large commercial banks have partnered with developers like myself in order to provide the capital that's required to actually roll out uh, the upfront capital cost associated with, with rooftop and small scale projects. So it's, it's happening. Um, it's one of the faster growing aspects of the renewable energy space in South Africa at this point in time. More questions? Uh, does anyone have the microphone or am I? I can't see. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, this is MTS Matab. Uh, I'm the managing director and CEO for Skypower. It's the um, 
uh, one of the largest developers of solar renewable energy in the world. Um, I've met, um, um, it's, it's a question to His Excellency. So we are, uh, you know, we understand the risk in Africa and there is a way to uh, mitigate those risks of, through various mechanisms. The challenge we see today is that lots of places that people are going to the bidding process, which is in the long term, I think is the right way to do it, but it creates a very slow momentum because I think the, uh, every country has a different structure. And uh, for, for, uh, for a company which is able to take risk and scale up, the, uh, scale up the program in a country, electrifying the country, they can do a direct bilateral. My question is, will you be open to that such a bilateral agreement? Because a lot of company, people, there is a two things. People think it's not going to be competitive, but on the other hand, there are certain companies who knows how to do it. And we're not only one, there are other companies, large companies who can put their balance sheet to develop. How you, what is your view on those bilateral agreements where a company wants to come in and develop the country and take those risks? Thank you. Thank you. That is a subject that we often discuss. Uh, often we are faced with a dilemma uh, between uh, uh, going quickly on projects and programs and the necessity of a fair competition and also transparency in the processes. Uh, this is the equation. If uh, we want to go uh, very quickly, we think that it is unacceptable, then we are accused of corruption, etc., etc. We have a very active civil society. Sometimes there is a delay in the procedures when there are international tenders. We need to have efficiency and transparency. In the case of Senegal, we also have in our law the fact that we can go through tenders. So we also avoiding to do that. We did that for solar at the beginning. No one wanted to participate at the beginning, but then we contacted four solar companies and we gave them contracts and we fixed the price that was lower than fuel. We have so much solar now that we are forced to go through bidding procedures. And uh, we are doing that uh, in the context of uh, scaling solar. So over a period of uh, one or two years, if we want to expand, we uh, need to consider the uh, reference prices of the bids. Uh, I prefer the bid uh, because it's, uh, it uh, causes less problems. Otherwise, there are accusations of corruption, etc. if there is okay thank you very much for your questions and to the audience for being here and participating in this discussion just to go through what we've spoken about this afternoon we've said uh, Tonya Cole said we need more advanced and futuristic policy in order to deal with the concerns that will arise in the future we need to look forward as far as costs go we've said that we need to have better, more innovative ways of delivering power to people <coughs> and having it be quality power. And before we wrap, I'd just like each and every one of you to tell me what your biggest takeaway is um, from this discussion, just to remind you what the overarching question was. What public-private partnership solutions have the potential to accelerate the provision of and access to electricity in rural households? Um, I think we'll begin as we introduced each other. Mr. Ireland. Okay. Um, I guess I would say, again, it's uh, the recognition that the go government and policymakers have to work with private sector in a cooperative manner to really develop the appropriate policies going forward. And, and that's going to be needed to uh, continue to be consistent, but uh, put in place that, that are investable. Because I think the key, the key to all of this is what Tanya said earlier. 
who's paying for it? And you got to pay for it through financing and and uh, and and getting that project finance in some cases as well as other financing. So I think that's going to be the key. And it's us working together and working in a in a form of trust is going to be the key. And it, it's across all power so all fuel sources, across all power types, and uh, and across the value chain. All right, Mr. Cole. I would say, I would say that um, Africa today needs every type of solution that you can find. There's not one solution that will solve the problem. So you need the big utilities, you need large scale, you need off-grid, you need solar, you need wind, you need the micro, uh, micro solar solutions. So there's a place for everyone to play. What is extremely important is while we're thinking about what everyone has to do, we have to be able to tie it all together. So we cannot leave it that everyone is running like the wild, wild west, doing exactly what they like. There must be a plan as to how you move from one to the other. Today I start with micro. The minute I start with that, I'm going to want more. And it means I'm going to begin to move up that value chain all the way till it gets to the large utility. So we must have a plan that ties everything together while realizing that everyone plays an important part in this. If we can do it at the same time, then I think we will shorten the period for which electricity is going to be available for all. But we must appreciate everybody's role in this. Government, private sector, regulators, civil society, innovators, young, old, everyone has a part to play. We all want the same thing. Every single person on the continent wants to walk into their house, turn a switch, and get the light. That's what we want. Mr. Sandra Naiko. Um, I have to agree with Tolly wholeheartedly uh, in terms of uh, what he said. Um, I think also when we look at it, we need to look at it in, in, in the spirit of inclusive growth, the theme of, of, of this year's World Economic Forum, and, and more so as to how we actually create businesses, sustainable businesses around this. So when we look at uh, renewable energy, be it at a utility scale, I think every country needs to look at how they can actually promote local business um, in country in order to also help facilitate the rollout of these kind of programs. Thank you. Ms. Tangubane. Well, I, as I said, I appreciated His Excellency's suggestion of uh, regional economic blocks cooperating around the issue of energy. AU has been driving intra-regional and inter-regional trade cooperation. We need to go to infrastructure cooperation, create a master plan for electrifying Africa, bring in the private sector and our development finance institutions. I think that will give us a push forward. Government, through sovereign guarantees, must bite down the risk to business. Business will be involved if the risk is minimized, minimized and government guarantees can serve that function. All right. And finally, Your Excellency. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank you very much. I think that uh, the discussion of this afternoon has uh, shown that we need a partnership, an expanded partnership framework. Uh, public and private partnership and then between different states and between the different governments uh, so that uh, electricity generation is regular. We also need the dialogue. We need a regional integration uh, so that uh, we concentrate on viable projects that cost less. And we also need partnership between the different states and uh, financial partners, uh, multilateral and bilateral, uh, to uh, create a synergy between uh, public funding and private funding. And also so that uh, the funding for uh, renewable energy is mobilized, and that is uh, the commitment of uh, partners that are the biggest polluters on the planet and that promised uh, to give $100 billion a year to fund uh, climate change. Africa could benefit uh, from all of that as well as in other parts of the world. So there needs to be a combination of all of that. Uh, integral partnership, a global mobilization on the issue of uh, energy. 
and as well as ensuring uh, financial resources and solve the issue of universal access to electricity. So I'd like to encourage uh, the states and partners and the private sector uh, so that we can all be mobilized, uh, so that uh, the planet is better electrified. Sometimes when you travel at night, uh, you are uh, discouraged uh, um, uh, along the coast uh, of uh, Senegal. Uh, everything uh, works properly, but in properly, but in remote areas, it does not. We have to have competitive costs. And uh, I, I call upon everyone uh, to ensure that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And thank you to the rest of my panelists. That concludes our discussion this afternoon. My name is Edith Kimani. Thank you for joining us.